Welcome to The Complete Musician, creativity at its core, exploring innovative musical ideas, thoughts, and techniques for the modern musician in today's society, with your hosts, James Nagus and Drew Phillips. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Complete Musician Podcast. I'm Drew, and I am not your host today. And I'm James, and um, that's going to do it for another episode of the Complete Musician Podcast. Uh, we wanted to make these shorter, so... Uh, oh, wait. That's, we didn't talk about anything. That was pretty short. Okay, well, I guess we should talk about something. And uh, today's topic is something that's kind of fresh on my mind because I was just at one, and that is workshops and also conventions. So, basically, what I want to talk about today is, well... What are workshops? Why should you go to workshops? What should you do? What shouldn't you do? And I know we have, gosh, stories, especially on what you shouldn't do. Um, That seems to be the rule with these podcasts is we list all the things that you shouldn't do. (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, we want to provide good advice, right? True. So anyway, uh, workshops. There's, of course, the big IHS one during the summer, but every instrument has their own And uh, I think they all are pretty similar. So the first question is, should you go to workshops? I think you should go to workshops, definitely. And what should you do at workshops? You should visit the city and not do anything with the horn. (laughs) I was just kidding. You uh, You should go to your workshops no matter what age you are. Uh, because there's something for everyone. And when you're there, you should go hear the awesome guest artists that are lined up. You should go and visit the uh, room with all the horns in it and play every single one of them to contaminate every one of them with the plague. And you should uh, go and uh, visit the, the... Rooms with all the music, so you can buy all the music that you want. Um, and you should meet all the people there because it's great networking opportunities. Well, you pretty much just covered everything I was going to say. Um, well, that was all for today. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That's it. That's another episode of the Complete Musician Podcast. You can contact <laughs> us at... Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, you hit the nail on the head there. I think, you know, uh, instrument workshops, they're fun and they're really good to hear new music, uh, especially for younger students, to get just enthusiastic about the instrument, to get a a larger perspective on how people play. And I can list uh, many times that I've gone to hear recitals where, uh, like a piece that is maybe not newer, but something that I've forgotten about that's played really spectacularly that even I'm like, oh, I like really want to do that now. Right. There's and yeah. there's a lot of good music that's played. There's some bad music that's played at these things too, but maybe that's just um mm, subjective yeah. perhaps. Mm, yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm just biased. But um no, there's a lot of uh, good opportunities as just from a, an attendee perspective, but yeah. I also want to talk about, you know, the the perspective of being an active participant in terms of um, we recommend that you'd go and actually try to perform at one of these or, yeah. you know, go do some kind of lecture recital. Uh, there's really interesting thing at the Southeast this year that I, I don't think I've seen at these workshops before, but they offered a couple doctoral students to present their research as kind of like a pre-dissertation project or maybe just post-dissertation, which I thought was fantastic. Yeah, like a like a forum for them to like get their research out there. That's really cool. Exactly. So I hope to see more of those, and I think those are good opportunities uh, for yeah. those students. But you're right. There's a ton of different opportunities to perform. Um, and, and like you were saying, for, for all the ages, like if you were a student, then you can participate in one of the, uh, the mock auditions, mm-hmm. right? Um, uh, the high or low mock audition. Uh, there's the solo competition in the different levels. So you're not competing with like, you know, a, a high school player is not competing with a graduate student um, right. in those. Um, or if you are in college, then hopefully you can con your professor into taking your <laughs> collegiate horn choir and playing with them. Right. And then also, if you're just a less experienced player, there's mass horn choirs to play in. 
and low stress things too where you can just go and have a good time oh do they still have the quartet competition some do yeah I remember, yeah, I remember competing in that a long time ago with my quartet when I was in school. Uh, I haven't been uh, to Southeast in a few years. Well, I went to the one at Vanderbilt. Right. Uh, we went and performed a few years ago. I didn't go to the one in Georgia, um, but I, I remember, uh, I remember it, there being a quartet competition mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah, that can be a really good goal to work towards as well. Yeah, if you didn't want to do the solo competition and didn't want to do audition excerpts, then you could play with your friends. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's nice, of course. I don't know if you get like a certificate or a pat in the back, but it's a really, it's a nice thing to hang on your wall if you've won one of those and yeah. um, a good motivation. So there's those elements uh, there. Like you said, networking is, is really the reason I go. And the great thing about these workshops is, you know, it's your region for the most part. And horn players, they're they're nice, and I would like to think that in other instrumental uh, workshops, you know, there are good people there too. Although there tends to be the the cliques, like there's the students, then there's the professors, and then you know the superstars, and those kind of are the groups. It's nice for them to mingle and mix, though. Yeah, and one of the other cool things about these workshops, uh, like talking about the different kind of you know, not levels of people, but like the, the ages or the like experience level of some people. Uh, it's cool when you get to mingle with like the superstar people, um, because usually they're just sitting around and, uh, you know, sometimes you just see them randomly. And in my experience, going up and just introducing yourself is really cool. And they're always really nice about it. They just want to talk real people. They're just yeah normal dudes. Yeah. So, or do debts. Yeah. It's cool. And I, that's a recommendation too. Like you said, is don't be shy. Just go up and introduce yourself. Yeah. And if you like what they do, then just say, "Hey, I really, you know, enjoy hearing your playing." Or this CD is inspirational, and that means a lot to them too. I'm sure it does. I'm sure. Like I, no matter what level you are, I'm sure it's really cool to hear when someone appreciates your work and what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also talked about yeah, buying stuff. These are good venues for picking up either pieces you need or uh, repair equipment or oh man yeah I, yeah i spend like way too much money on music every time i go because i like to get like duet books and stuff that mm -hmm. i and, like new stuff that i've never seen before um i always spend like way too much money for my studio but i always use it most of the time yeah it's yeah. i mean they, they usually have pretty good selections of stuff yeah. So, um, okay. And then let's open Pandora's box a little bit and talk about the horn room. Oh, uh, all right. <laughs> because. And the germs floating around in every leaf pipe. <laughs> let's not talk about that. That's okay. A little grody. Although, true. <laughs> but um, so the horn room, it's good because if you're actually looking for a horn, you can try out a bunch in a short period of time, do direct comparisons. You can. And usually the guys with the horns will let you take it on a little bit of a trial, like take it to a practice room nearby or something, as long as you like leave your, you know, birth certificate or whatever. Just kidding, not that. But uh, you like make sure that you give some collateral so that they have something of yours. Right. Um, and that's so what that you, you can take do. it away and try. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's absolutely what they should do, just like you would do with like a rental car or something. Because um, the problem with those rooms is that you can get a perception of how the horn plays by the way it feels but you really can't oh, yeah. tell how it sounds especially when there's seven thousand other people playing the same einheld and laban poorly oh. yeah. bringing up what you shouldn't do yeah we can segue into that is you shouldn't go and just blast notes you know there's ways to try out horns and we're not going to really talk about that this episode we might do it later but yeah definitely um if you are seriously looking for horns yeah take it to somewhere where you can actually hear the sound and not just go on how it feels because uh, we've both played horns that feel great and that right. have limitations in the sound and for me that's yeah. not good enough so uh, yeah absolutely and you're right when you're standing around and everyone's deciding to play their loudest version of the long call it's mm. not or like... highest notes that's a good or, one too. oh the high note competition mm -hmm. that's a good one yeah um the loud blasty competition yes the uh i mean because you're the, the goal you're trying to really impress people with that. everyone yeah. and 
Yeah, the competition of how many people can I deafen in my surrounding, you know, perimeter. That's the other one I hear a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, in all, you know, silliness aside, yeah, it's great to be able to take the horn out to a room, taking someone with you so mm, that they yes. can hear. Um, it's, it's good to have someone, another set of ears, especially someone who's either familiar with the horn you're looking at or a wide variety or, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, it's funny because the one thing on my what not to do is just the high note contest. So that's we already covered that yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, unless there's anything else you want to talk about for like the horn room, uh, not for the horn room now. Okay. Uh, the last thing I had on my list of workshops, and that that hasn't we haven't gone to conventions yet because there's something slightly different there. But right. it's just the and we touched on this a little bit is whether or not to bring your students and. Uh, what, how they will have a good experience. What's thing? How do you prompt them? Um, tell them, what do you tell them to do to get the most out of their time? And I think it's pretty much the same things. Number one, yeah, you should bring your students because we, I mean, you know, when we were students, like we said, it's these things that get us enthusiastic and um, about practicing and about horn and hearing all these good performances. Rather than being discouraged, it's encouraged, which is great. And so, you know, just tell them you're here, just dive right in, go to everything, go to all the concerts, go to all of the lectures and just really soak it in, especially for these regional ones, which are like two yeah. days, you know, yeah. two, three days, just go for it. And, oh, that reminds me of one other thing too, that, I mean, I'm guilty of sometimes at these workshops is there's a certain point where you just get burned out of hearing absolutely everything. But About, really try yeah. your best to support your colleagues and go oh, definitely. to their performances because you think about it when you're playing, nothing is better than looking out and seeing, you know, your friends. Um, and you may be tired and you may not want to hear the Beethoven horn sonata one more time, but it really means a lot to the performers who are playing. So just That's be true. a good colleague in that regard. Okay. Um, so conventions is the next thing. This one's shorter but i wanted to bring it up because there's a couple things there's one thing that um you have more experience than me and then there's one thing i did recently and when i'm talking conventions i'm talking like the music education conferences or like oh, yeah. tmea or midwest or yeah. even just those events where you either go as the capacity of a representative of your school which i think you yeah. did recently or yeah. uh giving sectionals which is something that i did recently uh, or you can present a lecture, like you can propose to give a session on, I don't know, low range for high school horn players or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, the one I just went to uh, was the North Carolina Music Educators Conference, and I was there representing Liberty, um, talking to all the prospective music students uh, about what Liberty has to offer. I met quite a few horn players, um, and I met quite a number of band and orchestra directors um and you know uh, chorus directors too um but I, I met a lot of them and talked to them about what we have to offer um and got lots and lots of emails and contact information and it was great to go to those things but yeah um what you're talking about giving lectures about the instrument specifically is a great thing because in my experience the ones that i've gone to they're not usually oriented towards instrumental stuff not what I've seen lately. I don't know your experience, but a lot of what I've seen is like elementary uh, oriented or chorus oriented. But man, if you have some like really outstanding research or you're really adamant or passionate about sharing something about teaching like high school, middle school horn players, man, it, those conferences would gladly accept you mm -hmm. um, because there's always open times. Like there are random times where things aren't happening that so many people would be interested in in learning about the horn right and what's the worst thing that can happen is that you go you're given a weird time maybe no one shows up maybe one person shows up you're still getting experience you're submitting your proposals and Absolutely. you're preparing and probably doing extra research and so it's a net positive experience yeah all right well i think that's a lot of good information on conferences and workshops conventions and workshops the, the sum is just i guess do it go go just go and just go. oftentimes funny things will happen and you'll have good stories good memories good yeah. memories and make sure to go try the local eateries 
of wherever you are. Uh, oh yeah, because that's the fun of traveling. Um, and the the cool thing is that there's always really my favorite thing about conventions, whether it be IHS or whether it be um, the regional workshops, is that there's always really neat new music like we were talking about. And so I get lots of ideas about like what I want to play, especially it's from like an up and coming composer or something that I've never heard before. Super cool. Mm -hmm. Especially when we go force people to listen to our music. Uh, Because we've done it a (laughs) few times. A few times. But you know, that's, that's what core moto does. We invite the world to experience new music that we think is okay too. Uh, We like playing. Yeah. Shameless plug, Cormoto. They have a podcast. You should check it out. It's called The Complete Musician. I don't know. Was that just an advertisement inception there? Uh, I think so. Okay. Well, uh, that's going to wrap up the segment on conventions and workshops. And we're actually going to get a quick word from our sponsor here. And then when we come back, we're going to do some more house calls. Do you have yellow tea? <coughs> Does your breath smell like brass? <coughs> Well, this is for you. From the company that brought you Smash Mouth Mouthwash comes a new and exciting innovation in dental hygiene. Here to talk about it is Jimmy Valentine. Mm. Eh, it's a tube of toothpaste. What do you want? Listen to some of our other excited brushers. It's like the baseline for my beauty regimen. I like my toothpaste like I like my music. Heavy metal. My family loves using this and it's terrible lesson. Super toothpaste really helps lower my gum lines. Yeah, I like it because it's never offbeat. Unlike me and my goatee inspired craft vegan longboard. So head on over to Handel's Save a Lot Grocery, the only grocery store to shop when you're Baroque. Located across the street from Sonata Daycare Center. And grab your own tube of toothpaste today. Tube of toothpaste does not exist and never has existed and will not fix your cavities or crimes or nerdiness because it's absurd and you are absurd for believing it. Tube of toothpaste is not an official sponsor of the Complete Musician Podcast. All right, it's time for some more house calls where we answer random music questions from the internet um, using the knowledge and good intention advice that we have. Because we are doctors and you would always follow your doctor's advice. Right. You would. So here we go. Question number one. And I think this comes from the uh, Reddit Horn subreddit. Thing. Always a good place to get advice. Yes. Yes. And the question is, why do my notes crack so much? I feel like I'm constantly cracking high notes. Mm. Well, I, uh, I would have some advice, but... Ooh. I don't know. But... Uh, <laughs> It may just be an air thing. Oh, um, I don't have any advice because I think I must have submitted this question. Uh, uh, yeah, I may have done that a really long time ago. Yep. Because that's a little too real. But Boo! we digress. Let's see. Uh, for high notes, um, what you need to do is arch your eyebrows, <laughs> lift your chin, and use a lot of pressure. A ton of pressure right on the bottom lip. Yes. And if you have the octave key, um, which is where your pinky goes, there's when you use that. You know that you're doing really well when you have no teeth left. <laughs> that would be hard to play. Uh, you, I can, you mean, you can't gum everything when you play? I thought that was how people <laughs> over 80 played. <laughs> well, I guess they always said that a smiling embouchure is a bad one. I guess you can't have a smiling embouchure if you have no teeth. But you can smile when you don't crack any more of your high notes. Mm -hmm. Ah, I think we've sufficiently answered that question. Okay, here we go. This comes, these next two come from general music Mm, subreddits. All right, got it. And uh, this question is, what comes after subcontrabass? Is there even something lower? So I Mm. guess they're talking about like um, a clarinet or saxophone, or is this like maybe an upright subcontrabass? Maybe... Sub contra basement. Well, sub contra makes me think of video games and submarines with... and fishing. Hmm. Sub contra base. It's probably just the next. The next instrument down would definitely be a really big fish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a whale. 
like a sub contra whale. Probably. I think is next. Yeah. Well, I was thinking uh, perhaps a ground bass, like they had back in the uh, the days of the Baroque, because uh, if you put your bass on the floor, it becomes a ground bass. Oh, good one. Yeah, and if you put it underground and bury it where it belongs, then it becomes an underground bass. Hmm. So I guess that's our answer right there. Either an underground bass or an or underground whale. whale. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, that's. Uh, hey, that sounds scientific to me. Problem solved. And our final question, this one is a real... Um, this one's going to take some thought. Mm, okay. It's Put a little bit longer on. one, so uh, hang with me here. All right. Okay. Uh, and also, I'm I'm not judging grammar, but here I've it is. Got my, I've got my legal pad. I'm taking notes. Okay, good. Okay. <clears throat> How to play the song when someone gives you the chords. For example, someone plays a song and gives you the chords, but then if you just ring all the chords, it doesn't sound anything like the song. What am I missing here? Hmm. Okay, I really think we need to go back and dissect this question part by part. Mm -hmm. Give me the first phrase. How to play the song when someone gives you the chords. How to play the song. Okay, so this sounds like an e-how video. How to play the song when mm -hmm. when you're given the chords, right? Right. And we and we know from the e how videos that the setup of this is you have to be in front of a curtain, a very wrinkled, dark curtain, mm -hmm. and you have to wear uh, very little uh, makeup and have very bad lighting, um, and generally not know what you're talking about. Right. So really, this question is starting from uh, ground zero of uh, knowing the song uh at least you know the song and if you know the chords see this is i guess assuming that you don't know the chords is that right i think you're just given the chords you want to play the song but all you have is the chords oh but i got you, it backwards okay. it doesn't sound like the song because you're just playing oh, the chords okay no i i understand now no this is a uh this is an inversion okay i i understand um you're inverting the, the chords one in, in eternity that, so that later song sounds like something with just the chords like an e-how video okay mm -hmm. what's the next part the next part was for example someone plays a song and gives you the chords but then if you just ring all the chords it doesn't sound anything like the song and so this person is asking what are they missing oh i uh so here we find the dilemma see they're ringing the chords Mm -hmm. They're ringing them. So this is for handbell choir. So really <laughs> what this is, is this is an e-how video of how to play songs in handbell choir. Right. And like everyone knows, there are no melodies in handbell choir. It's just no. chords. No. So this is, this makes so much sense. They should have just said this. This is for handbell choir, not for whatever vague musical, you know, setting that they're trying to think about. So... Uh, so they're not this, missing anything. No. Per, they've actually answered their own question. They have yeah. no melody. It's supposed to just be chords. Oh, unless, what am I missing here? Meaning current location. Maybe they just forgot their actual handbells. Mm, so That's why it doesn't sound like it, because they're not actually holding any bells. What are they holding? A taco. Or mm. something. A Taco okay. Bell? They got it confused. <gasps> they got it so confused. They are yep. holding a Taco Bell instead of a hand bell, and that's why it that's just it. sounds like lettuce and tomatoes flying all over the place. <laughs> no wonder you can't tell what the song is. That was their beef, I guess. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we've dosed out enough um, good information for one episode, so we're going to wrap this up. Uh, this has been another episode of the Complete Musician Podcast. Thanks for joining us, as always. And if you want to send us a note, drop us a line. Either just leave a note below if you're on YouTube, or send us an email at coremotohorn at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook page that we post our podcasts on, and you can certainly leave us a comment there, because uh, we'd love to hear from you. And remember, as John F. Kennedy may have said, those who dare to fail miserably can choose viola. Oh.